Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second plenary at the um, uh, Consciousness Conference. And today's uh, topic is going to be on reality and illusion. We welcome two uh, wonderful speakers. Uh, one is Professor Don Hoffman at University of California, Irvine. And uh, the second speaker will be uh, Professor Keith uh, Frankish at the University of Sheffield, and my name is Eva Shim. I'll be the moderator. The way that we are going to run this session is that um, we'll have uh, the, the first speaker uh, present his talk first, so Professor uh, Hoffman will go first, and we'll just take a couple of questions or uh, clarifications uh, for specific to his talk, and then followed by um, Professor uh, Frankish, and uh, from there we'll take a couple of questions there too, and then we'll open to more general questions. Um, I'll let each speaker to briefly speak um, and introduce themselves who they like, and um, we'll go from there. And um, thank you for joining us. So, Don? Hello, I'm Don Hoffman. I'm a professor emeritus now of uh, cognitive science at the University of California at Irvine, and I've been, uh, my background is studying visual perception and, and uh, and consciousness, and so this is it's a real pleasure to be here. And so should I just uh, share my screen of the, the slides then? Yes, please. Okay. So, okay. If you have a stroke in area V4 of your left hemisphere, you'll lose all color experience in the right half of your visual world. You'll still see color in the left half, but in the right half, you'll only see shades of gray. Research has uncovered scores of correlations like this between neural activity and specific conscious experiences. The hard problem of consciousness for me is to construct a scientific theory that explains these specific correlations, specific ones like between V4 and color experience. Sensory experiences, like seeing a rabbit, are typically thought of as mental states that are the output of sensory systems of the brain. They present or represent physical features of an external world, such as the shape, color, and position of the rabbit, and also they have a qualitative aspect, a what it is like aspect that we can call phenomenal consciousness. Explaining phenomenal consciousness is perhaps the hard part of the hard problem of consciousness. Illusionism proposes that there's no such thing as phenomenal consciousness. Instead, your belief in phenomenal consciousness is an illusion, a magic trick played on you by your brain. So there's no phenomenal. Um, it's like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. It's an illusion. But the, the argument is that the illusion is adaptive. Evolution by natural selection has shaped uh, this illusion into our species, presumably because it enhances our fitness. So as, as uh, Keith Frankish has put it, um, introspection delivers a partial distorted view of our experiences, misrepresenting complex physical features as simple phenomenal ones. So the idea, as I understand it, is that our sensory systems are physical and their outputs are physical, not phenomenal. It is other brain processes, introspective processes, that then misrepresent the physical processes of the brain as phenomenal. Keith tells us what he means by the word physical. He says, I use physical in a broad sense for properties that are either identical with or realized in microphysical properties. So, um, so for example, the microphysical particles of the standard model of physics would, would count as physical. So are larger macroscopic objects such as pyramidal neurons and, and their properties. And so are macroscopic objects such as the brain and its neural activity. Some properties some properties of neural activity are misrepresented by introspection as phenomenal experience, and Frankish calls these properties quasi-phenomenal properties. So these are physical properties of the brain, um, but that are misinterpreted as phenomenal properties by, for example, our introspection processes. So as, as Keith puts it, 
Um, a quasi-phenomenal property is a non-phenomenal physical property of the brain, presumably, that introspection typically misre misrepresents as phenomenal. So the outputs of the sensory processes in the brain are misrepresented by introspection, leading to the illusion of phenomenal experiences. And, and, and Keith argues that this illusion is a product of natural selection. The phenomenal illusion is an adaptive one which has been hardwired into our psychology. So the idea is that um, evolution by natural selection has actually wired this illusion into us for, for good reasons. Um, it's, it's adaptive and, and we needed it as part of our fitness. Now, this point of view that um, evolution could lead us to have false beliefs um, is actually, um, I think, well supported. Um, Steven Pinker in his wonderful paper, So How Does the Mind Work? Um, canvases um, five different reasons for why um, evolution could favor illusion. So for example, it's very expensive to compute the truth. Truth costs time and energy. Um, if it takes you a half an hour to figure out how to do something you know, truthfully in 10 minutes, well, maybe you shouldn't spend the half hour. Maybe you should use heuristics and, and, and rules of thumb. Um, much of cognition and perception um, is non-demonstrative inference. And therefore, we need to make assumptions. Um, and the prior assumptions that we make uh, are typically fallible. What uh, allowed us to survive in the Pleistocene may not lead us to truth today. There are social pressures in groups and out groups. Um, often our beliefs um, uh, are tailored to make us fit in with the group, not, not the truth. Intellectual virtuosity. Um, there's many reasons for us to try to show how smart we are and have exotic beliefs to show how in intelligent we are. As Pinker points out that that might explain a lot of academia. Well, you know, so it's. And then um, an argument that uh, Robert Trivers has made is that um, you know there are selection pressures for us to deceive others, and in some sense the best deceiver is the one who's self-deceived, doesn't even know that they're deceiving others. So for for these and other reasons, it's it's. Um, I mean, the idea that evolution could program us with illusions is you know, spot on. It could certainly do that. So there are very good reasons for that. So, so evolution could wire us with some false beliefs, but did it in fact wire us with false phenomenal beliefs? So to do that, um, illusionism must do science. And as, as Keith well, as points out in his papers as well. So for instance, um, it needs to have um, a notion of precise quasi-phenomenal properties for specific uh, cognitive me mechanisms and specific neural instantiations for specific illusions. So what is the quasi-phenomenal property for mint, the taste of mint, or particular red 31? And this is something that, that uh, Keith has, has mentioned himself in, in his, his own writing. So this is, you know, the hard problem of consciousness where you, uh, you're thinking about phenomenal consciousness gets turned into the hard problem of finding these quasi-phenomenal properties and understanding the illusion. So, so there's some serious science to do there. Um, um, to do this, um, we could use evolutionary games, right? So you can use evolutionary game theory and, and do simulations of that. Uh, you could also do simulations of genetic algorithms to show how um, these illusions could arise. Um, and then you could also try to prove theorems, right? I mean, evolution by natural selection is, is mathematically precise, so we could try to prove theorems. So, so, so what you know, the road ahead, I think, illusionism, and I'm very interested in talking about this later, is to turn it into a precise science, and I would love to, to discuss how, how that might go. So. Now, I, I talk about actually um, proving a theorem, and you might ask, well, what in the world am I talking about in this? And so um, I, I'd like to demonstrate what, what I mean by actually doing it in another case. Um, so, so our sensory experiences present us with physical properties, such as the, the rabbit's shape, its color, uh, its texture, its position, and its movement. And we can ask whether these physical properties, right? So think about experiences as having physical properties and these putative phenomenal properties. And you know, we've 
illusionism says the phenomenal properties are illusory. I'm saying, what about the physical properties? Are the physical properties reported by our sensory systems also illusory? So I see a rabbit. Is it an illusion? Perhaps there is no rabbit when I don't look. Perhaps physical reality is just a virtual reality. So we can have physical properties and phenomenal properties, and we can ask in, each, in both cases, um, are there adaptive reasons, evolutionary reasons, to think that each might be illusory? So, so we can ask a precise question. Does natural selection favor vertical perceptions? And by vertical perceptions, I mean not perceptions that are exhaustively true about the world. Now, no one thinks that we see our senses show us all of reality as it is. But most theorists in, in vision science, for example, think that um, natural selection has shaped our sensory systems to show us the truths that we need to survive. So we are seeing truths. I see the shape of the rabbit. I'm seeing something that's approximately true about the true shape and position and movement of the rabbit and its color and so forth. No one thinks that we see exhaustive truth. So, so, so we can, um, we can ask this precise question, and, and it turns out um, that there is a mathematical framework for understanding evolution by natural selection. This is the replicator equation, and I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the replicator equation, but j just to point out that natural selection, um, John Maynard Smith turned it into a mathematically precise theory, and we can use that theory to run simulations and also to prove theorems about what, what selection would do. So the key thing I want to talk about in this equation um, are the notions of fitness payoffs that, that uh, uh, show, show up here in the, in the AIJ and the FJ. What are fitness payoffs? That's the key concept that we'll need here. So what are fitness payoffs? Consider a steak. How does it affect the fitness of an animal? Well, for a, a hungry lion that wants to eat, it offers a lot of fitness points. Think about fitness payoffs as like points in a game. You're trying to win a, a, a video game, and you're trying to get enough points to win the game. But for a, a sated lion that wants to mate, the steak offers no fitness points at all. And for a rabbit in any state, um, it offers no fitness payoffs. So, so the point is that fitness payoffs, which are the key currency in evolution, do depend on objective reality, whatever that objective reality might be. They are functions of objective reality, but also, and importantly, on the organism, like lion versus rabbit, its state, hungry versus sated, and um, the action, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. So fitness, not the state of reality, is what matters in evolution by natural selection. That's where all the points are. So let's talk a little bit about the notion of fitness. Um, fitness is, as the little diagram there indicates, it's a very complicated function in general. It's a function of the world, the organism, its state, and its action. So the objective world is in the domain of the function. Um, so we can write it this way. The, it's a function from the world, W, and the organism, O, its state, S, and the action, A, into a set R of payoffs. It could be a finite set or the real line. Um, I'll, I'll think about it as, a, as a, a finite positive set. So with that kind of notion of, of evolutionary game theory and fitness payoffs, we can ask a technical question. Does natural selection favor veridical perceptions? And I've, I've um, worked with um, some graduate students and colleagues we ran simulations. We, um, Brian Marion, Justin Mark did some evolutionary game simulations. Justin Mark did some genetic algorithms. And these all suggested quite strongly that organisms that see reality as it is um, never outcompete organisms of equal complexity that see none of reality at all. And their senses are not tuned to show any of the structure of reality at all. They just are tuned to, to report fitness payoffs. And so I went to a mathematician, Chaitan Prakash, and he's proved a couple theorems. Uh, we call one of them the fitness beats truth theorem. And, and the theorem basically says um, the probability is zero that, in, that natural selection will shape our sensory systems to truly report 
um, the structure of whatever objective reality is. And the interesting thing about this theorem is that we don't need to assume that we know what objective reality is. So I'm not saying I know, you know what re uh, reality is and we couldn't ever see that. I'm saying the theorem shows on evolutionary grounds that whatever the structure of reality is, our senses will not be shaped to see it. So vertical perception goes extinct. So to understand at top level why this could be, because it, it seems ludicrous, right? It, it, in some sense, how could our senses be useful if they don't report truths about physical reality? How could they possibly be useful? Well, so to give you an intuition, I'm gonna start with this a complex fitness payoff, but let's make it simple. Uh, let's make a very simple fitness payoff. So on the horizontal axis, there's some resource in objective reality. I'll call it stuff, S-T-U-F. And there could be a small amount, a medium amount, or a large amount of stuff. Um, but that's a total order, right? This is a, a, a total ordered set from small to medium large. Large is bigger than medium, medium is bigger than small. That's a total order. So suppose there's this total order structure in objective reality. And suppose that we have fitness payoffs that form something like that Gaussian curve, just, just to be concrete. So there could be for small amounts of stuff, there's very little fitness payoff. For medium amounts of stuff, there's a lot. And then for large amount of stuff, there's very little fitness payoff. Okay? So suppose that that was reality. Stuff goes from small to large, and the fitness is this Gaussian payoff fitness. And things like th this could happen in our own world, like oxygen, um, right? A little bit of oxygen will kill you. Too much will kill you. A little bit is just right. A medium amount is just right. Same thing with ultraviolet. So this, this is a you know this kind of fitness payoff is not unusual. So let's let's look at this for a little bit. Um, so there's our fitness payoff. Um, a little bit or a large amount will kill you, but a medium amount is just right. And let's suppose that we have a creature that's going to evolve, and it only has two sensory states, red and green. Those are the only two sensory states it has, and we want to see. Um, you know, you know, how would evolution shape the organism's sensory states? Now, one can imagine a truth organism that is that its sensory states, red and green, are positioned to give you the maximum amount of information about the truth. So if you want to know the maximum amount, you would have this kind of mapping. So, so medium to large amounts of stuff you would see as green, and small to medium amounts you would see as red. And that way, if you see green, you know as, as much as you could know about the truth about stuff uh, as you can with just one bit of information, right? This is just one bit of information. You would know that there's a large amount of stuff. And if you saw red, you would know that there's a little bit, uh, you know there's less stuff. So this is a, um, a mapping of the state of stuff into your colors that would, re that would be a homomorphism, where you actually know from the colors something about how much stuff there is. Then there's a different mapping that focuses on fitness. And in this case, what you would do is you would map greens, say, to the amount of stuff that has high fitness and red to low fitness. And as a result, if you look at that, you'll realize that the creature that sees red and green in terms of fitness, when it sees red, it doesn't know if there's a large amount or a small amount of stuff you've lost information about the structure of reality. You've destroyed, it's no longer a, a homomorphism of reality um, structures into your perceptions. So, whereas with the truth organism, in this particular example, note that the truth organism, when it sees green, it doesn't know if it's safe or not. And if it sees red, it doesn't know if it's safe or not. So it knows the truth, but it's going to die because it doesn't, its, its senses don't give it the information it knows that it needs to get what's um, going to keep it alive. So this just shows in a concrete example that seeing the truth and seeing fitness are, ex are entirely different things. They're not at all the same and they need not be correlated. So tracking fitness is not the same thing as tracking the world. So what, what do I mean by tracking? So we have the fitness payoff function, right? And it is a function. So, and it's a function of the state of the world and it would be, it would be a tracking. So a fitness payoff function 
would track the world if it was a homomorphism. That is, if, if the fitness payoffs preserve some structure of the objective world. So for example, the uh, one I just mentioned was a total order. That was one structure. And I showed you how, how fitness payoffs might not track them. But there could be metrics, topologies, groups, rings, any structure that you want to, to imagine that the world might have. And in each case, there's a clean technical question. Do, what is the probability that a fitness payoff function will track that structure in the world? And we just published a paper where we looked at orders, um, some, some groups, and measurable structures. In each case, we prove the probability is precisely zero. So the probability that a fitness payoff will track, will, will have information about the structure of objective reality is zero. And if the fitness payoff functions don't have information about the structure of the world, then natural selection cannot tune you to that structure in the world. It's that simple. If the information is not in the fitness payoffs, the natural selection cannot do it. So that's the, the, the notion of the theorem. And an example, again, as I mentioned, is oxygen. It turns out um, we didn't even discover oxygen until 1773, but our senses gave us fitness payoff information about quote unquote oxygen. If there was not enough, you got a headache. Um, and if, if there was too much, you got dizzy. And if you had just the right amount, you felt alert and fine. That's what evolution gives us. It gives us little simple reports about what's going to keep you alive, but not about the true structure of, of reality. So this is a different kind of illusionism. It's not an illusionism about the phenomenal aspects of sensory experiences. It's an illusionism about the physical or structural aspects of it. So what, what view of our senses does this lead to then? What, what it leads to is the idea that our senses have not been shaped by evolution to be a window on reality. Instead, they've been shaped be, to be a virtual reality. It's a virtual reality, much like uh, a virtual reality video game that's, does, that's shaped to let you win the game. But when you're playing, a, like say a virtual reality version of Grand Theft Auto, uh, you don't want to be trying to deal with the reality, which in that metaphor would be the diodes and resistors, the voltages and magnetic fields. If you had to do that, you're going to lose the game. Anybody who's playing with that kind of truth can't beat someone who just has this nice user interface that allows you to play the game. Or you can think about it this way, the desktop on your computer, right? Um, if you're writing a uh, you know, paper or writing a, a talk and the icon for your paper or your talk is blue and rectangular, and you know, in the lower right corner of your screen, that doesn't mean that the, the file itself in your computer is blue or rectangular or in the lower right corner of your computer. Anybody who thought that misunderstands the whole point of the desktop interface. It's not there to show you the truth, you know, the voltages and magnetic fields. It's there to hide the truth. The reason the interface is useful is precisely because it's not truthful about the structure of objective reality. It gives you a virtual interface that lets you control the truth, even though you're ultimately completely ignorant. Few of us know about the details of the voltages and magnetic fields in our, in our computers. That doesn't stop us. That lack of knowledge of the truth doesn't stop us from using the computer because we have a useful interface. Obvious objection, there's many objections, and, um, but I'll, I'll get one. Hoffman, if you think that train coming down the tracks is just uh, an illusion, an, an interface icon like the desktop icon, um, then why don't you step in front of it? And after you're dead and your theory with you, we'll know that that train was real and it really can kill. And I wouldn't step in front of the train for the same reason that I wouldn't carelessly drag that blue icon to the trash can. Not because I take the icon literally, the, the talk or the file is not literally blue and rectangular, but I do take it extremely seriously. If I drag that icon to the trash can, I could lose a year of work. So, and that's the point. Um, evolution shaped us with a user interface to keep us alive. We have to take it seriously. If you see a snake, don't pick it up. If you see a cliff, don't jump off. It's there to keep you alive. And those who don't take it seriously, don't pass on their genes. So we have to take it seriously, but that does not logically entail that we should take it literally. So I take, all of our senses quite seriously, but not literally. 
So what does this mean? It means that space and time and physical objects and all of their structures are a virtual reality, completely disjointed from the structure of the objective world, whatever that structure might be. The structure of space-time um, on evolutionary grounds is entirely unlike any structure in objective reality. And the structure of any objects in space-time is also unlike any structure in objective reality. So when we see pyramidal neur neurons, we're seeing a virtual reality icon that's useful to us, not the truth. And the same thing with brains and brain processes. We're seeing an icon that we've been uh, evolved to, to see. And it's a virtual reality to keep us alive. And the probability that any of the structures that we're seeing track true structures in reality is provably zero on evolutionary grounds. Now, it's one thing for a cognitive scientist to be saying all this highfalutin stuff about physical reality. What do the physicists say? And of course, physicists do not speak with one voice. Physicists have many, many different attitudes about this. Um, and uh, so I will just point out that there are some physicists um, whose ideas are in, in fact uh, congenial. I wouldn't say that they endorse what I'm saying, but they're congenial. They don't necessarily dismiss what I'm saying. So Nima Arkani Hamed, for example, at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton um, says um, space-time is doomed. There's no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the actual underlying description of the laws of physics, which is exactly what evolution by natural selection entails as well. That the very struct that space-time as we perceive it and then also the elaboration of, so we, of course we don't perceive space-time, right? We, we perceive space, we perceive time, we perceive them as the sort of local kinds of things. Space-time itself is sort of a, a more sophisticated construct that Einstein came up with and we use. But, but what I'm saying is that the predicates of space and time, the notion of the order of close and far in space and sequence and time, those predicates, which we've then as scientists, you know, fashioned into the more sophisticated theory of special relativity, for example, those predicates are the wrong predicates to describe objective reality. And that's what some physicists are saying, that space-time cannot be fundamental. And, and if people want to understand why, we can talk, I can discuss a little bit later about why they're saying that space-time can't be fundamental. So, but that's saying that the whole story about the Big Bang and a completely physical universe with no life and no consciousness, uh, and then uh, the late coming of life after millions or billions of years, and late coming of that whole story is um, is gone because space time itself is not fundamental. That we have to have a completely new understanding, and the very notion of cause and effect in space and time also has to be um, let go. There is no such thing as cause and effect between objects in space and time. It's a useful fiction. Just like if you're playing Grand Theft Auto in virtual reality, it's a useful fiction that if I turn the steering wheel to the left, that causes my car to go a certain direction. If I turn the steering wheel to the right, it goes. It's a useful fiction, but strictly, strictly speaking, it's just a fiction. And that's what evolution gave us. Uh, the illusion that I hit the white ball, that knocks the eight ball into the corner pocket, and that's causality. That's, it's a useful fiction for everyday life. It's perfectly harmless to believe that fiction. But when we go to the hard problem of consciousness, that fiction comes back to bite us. So now the idea that space and time is not fundamental um, is as Arkani Hamid says, that's very startling because what physics is supposed to be about is describing things as they happen in space and time. So if there's no space time, it's not clear what physics is about. And so, so physics is not in a position where it's saying, oh yes, space-time is the absolute reality and cause and effect in space-time we know is fundamental. Physicists, many physicists, the best, the best and brightest are saying, hey, space-time is gone. We don't know what, what, you know, it's not clear what physics is about when space-time is gone. And then there are others that I'll mention like, like um, Chris Fuchs and David Merman with quantum Bayesianism, where they're saying that the quantum wave function itself is not a statement of objective reality, it's a statement of the subjective degrees of belief of an agent. So, so now in conclusion, um, you know, Keith in 
in his wonderful paper at the, the start of his book on illusionism, he, he points out that m most people find it incredible, even ludicrous, to suppose that phenomenal consciousness is illusory. Um, but if the illusion's been hardwired into our psychology for good evolutionary reasons, then that is to be expected. And I agree with him on that. If evolution has wired in something into our psychology, then it's, then it's going to feel ludicrous to us to challenge it and, and completely. So it's, it's wired in through eons of evolution and, and it's going to be, it's the, it's the, the lenses that we look at reality through. It's hard to go back and look at the eyes that are that you're looking through, right? But in the case that I'm talking about, that the illusion of space and time and physical objects, we actually know something about this illusion. Um, Piaget talked about um, object permanence. Um, that babies before a certain age, uh, they see he proposed they see objects and they just see the experience. And you know, you go you hide you show a doll to a baby and then hide it behind a pillow behind it before a certain age, the baby just goes on as though the, the, ba the doll ceased to exist. Um, but after a certain age, um, they go looking for the doll behind the pillow. They get object permanence. They get the belief that objects really exist. What we see is the truth, even when we don't look. Um, Piaget thought it was 18 months. Later research shows it's as early as three or four months. But, but here's the point we've been wired by evolution to believe that the objects that we see, the icons of our interface, really exist, even when we don't perceive them. The moon is really there when no one looks. And so it's not surprising that we find it ludicrous to even imagine that we could be wrong about physical objects existing when they're not perceived. So that's object permanence. So as Keith says in his wonderful paper, the question is not whether illusion ism is intuitively plausible, but whether it's rationally compelling. And I couldn't agree more. The, the theorem that I've just presented is, is saying that um, none of what you see around you, space and time and physical objects, their structure, none of that is objective reality. All of it is merely a user interface that's been shaped by natural selection to hide the truth and guide adaptive behavior. And it's not surprising that it's uh, implausible because we've been shaped by natural selection to have that illusion. So we're, we're stuck in the illusion and, and that's what we've got. So thanks to my many collaborators who um, were absolutely essential in, in doing this work. And, and I'll stop there and, and take questions. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk and for sharing your view about consciousness through um, illusionism. Um, there are a couple of questions from uh, the audience and I'll, I'll maybe try to uh, take a few here so that we have a bit of time for later as well. So John, for the first question, um, so you've been using a lot of uh, mathematical forum as a, a theorem to, to explain this, but one of the questions that came up was, do you think that metaphor, narrative and the like might be better symbol systems than math for turning the subjective into the objective? Well, I think that metaphor and, and so forth are very, very useful tools and, and, and we should use them. Um, and I, in fact, I have used a metaphor, right? The, the, the user interface metaphor and, and, and so forth. So, and I, and I think those metaphors are, are very, very helpful. Um, but ultimately, as this is a science of consciousness conference and, and ultimately, unless we, you know, we, as scientists, we can use the metaphors to get our intuitions and a lot of the creative work is done in metaphors, but ultimately, you got to turn the metaphor into math. So Einstein, for example, had the, back in what, 1907, he had the insight, if I'm falling in an elevator, I'll be weightless. Brilliant insight. He's the happiest thought of his life. It took him seven or eight years of agony and hard work and learning the math to turn that into an equation. And when he did, then the equation came back and slapped him in the face. It said there are black holes and he didn't like it. And so the reason we go from metaphors to mathematics is that the mathematics comes back and it teaches us that our, our metaphors and our ideas have consequences that we didn't even understand. So that's why we do the mathematics. I should mention one critique here is people will say, hey, uh, you, you, you say that evolution shaped us not to see the truth. Well, what about mathematics? Didn't it shape mathematic 
abilities not to be true as well. And it turns out the arguments I gave for sensor experiences do not hold for mathematics and logic. You have to do a separate analysis for different cognitive capacities. There are selection pressures for some facility in mathematics and logic simply because we must reason with some success about fitness payoffs. Two bites of an apple give you more fitness payoffs than one bite. Someone who can't understand that simple mathematical fact will be less fit. So I'm not saying there's selection pressures to be geniuses, but there are selection pressures to have some facilities. So the arguments I gave were specifically just for our sensory experiences and for no other cognitive capacities. Okay, thank you. And then maybe one more. Um, what would you say about evolution tuning the senses to the Goldilocks regions where ho uh, homeostasis, um, according to the internal state sensors, gives the best survival chance with deviations motivating action? Well, that was sort of the point of the example I gave where I was showing just the red and green, sort of the, I was pointing out that evolution will shape you with certain of your senses, say the green, that's saying if things are green, things are good. Keep doing whatever you're doing, keep doing it because it, it's green. But if you're doing something red, well, then change what you're doing, right? Because you know, you're doing the wrong thing. So absolutely, in, in some sense, our, our senses have evolved to keep us in homeostasis. But keeping us in homeostasis doesn't mean telling us the truth about objective reality. It's just like if you're hiking, right? If you go, like for me, if I go over 7,000 feet, I start to get headache. Well, I don't need to know about oxygen. I, I, I don't even know about you know, oxygen or particles or anything. I just know that I'm doing something wrong. I need to get down the hill. And, that's, and, and so that's, that's what's useful. So, so it just tells us whatever you're doing is wrong, change it. And, and then when you go down and you get down to 3,000 feet, you feel better. Then you know that this is okay. So that's what evolution does. It shapes us. I, so I, I'll make the strong claim. Space-time itself and all the properties of objects, none of that is true. All of it is, is literally just a user interface that's as completely disjointed from objective reality as the icons on your desktop are from the diodes and resistors in the computer. Thank you. There are a couple of more questions, but we'll save some of those for later. We'll go ahead and move forward with um, Keith's presentation. And um, uh, please go ahead and put up your slides. Uh, right, I... Let's see if I can share my screen. How's that? That's perfect. Thank you. So you have my slides and... Uh, you have me too, I guess? Yes. Okay, well, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll plan straight into this. Um, so, Don's book is called The Case Against Reality, so I've called my talk The Case Against Consciousness, but there is a, an asterisk next to the word consciousness, and that's the first thing that I want to, to stress. Uh, see, why isn't this advancing? I know why, I haven't clicked on it. Right. The case against, well, Don's case against reality is actually the case against one conception of reality. He doesn't think that there isn't a mind independent reality. Uh, he thinks we have the wrong conception of it. We think of it as being uh, space time and spatio temporarily, temporarily located objects. He thinks reality is something very different from that. And similarly, my case against consciousness is a case against one conception of consciousness. I don't deny that consciousness exists. I, deny that we're thinking of it uh, correctly. And the, the way that, that I, um, the wrong conception, I think the case, um, the one that I want to reject is the conception of consciousness as awareness of a private inner world of mental qualities, mental qualities, these phenomenal properties, qualia, whatever word we choose to describe them. The idea is that being conscious involves a kind of direct awareness of some private inner mental world. That's the conception of consciousness that I want to reject. I don't deny that we're conscious, that we have pains and feelings and so on. I deny that it involves awareness of a private inner world. So this is the problem of consciousness, I take it. Um, I'm afraid my slides aren't quite as uh, uh, colorful and uh, dynamic as, um, as Don's, but um, uh, I hope they'll get the core idea across. So here's the problem of consciousness. 
we have this world of spatiotemporally located objects, and we have this world of private mental qualities. And the question is how that, the spatiotemporally located physical objects, how they give rise to this, how these two things are related to each other. And uh, one way is to deny the existence of the spatiotemporal world, and the other way is to deny the existence of the inner world. And uh, Don's, Don takes the first, the first uh, option. And he appeals to Darwinian theory, and he quotes this passage from Daniel Dennett, which I, which I really like too. Uh, Darwinism is a universal acid. It eats through just about every traditional concept and leaves in its wake a revolutionized worldview with most of the old landmarks still recognizable, but transformed in fundamental ways. And I, I, I love that quote, and I think Don loves it too. And I think we both agree that taking Darwinism seriously means being, having to be prepared to rethink some of our very fundamental assumptions about reality, including mental reality. So um, Don has already given a wonderful presentation of his views. I'll just run very quickly through it because it will link nicely into what I want to say. So the, fit, the fitness beats truth theorem, evolution by natural selection does not favor true perceptions, routinely drives them to extinction. Don's already introduced that. Perception is designed to guide useful action, not to reveal the truth. So what we have is this interface theory of perception. Perception isn't a window on objective reality. It's an interface that hides objective reality behind a veil of helpful icons. So what we're actually aware of is this private mental world. And it's a private mental world tailored to enable us to thrive. And so apples, snakes, and other physical objects understood as occupants of the uh, of a, uh, an independent physical world simply don't exist. They're just icons in your 3D desktop. So universal acid dissolves reality as we conceive of it, as we, uh, as we normally conceive of it. And this sort of recenters things. There's a, there's a reality outside, uh, outside our minds, but its character is unknown to us. What we know is the world projected on our interior desktop, on our interface. Tomato here is something existing in our minds only. There is something out there that is causing that icon to be produced and the icon itself is helping us to negotiate that external reality, but we don't, at least perception doesn't tell us what that external reality is. Maybe we can work it out in other ways that we can't get it from perception. And of course, the same goes for the brain itself. That itself is part of the, um, uh, uh, of, uh, is just another icon in our interface. And again, what it actually corresponds to, we don't know. Perception doesn't reveal. And the same goes for the entire universe, for everything, space time itself. And then, the third element of Don's theory is conscious realism, uh, which is independent of the other two claims. I mean, it's a, it's a further claim that the that what that reality itself is actually composed of other conscious agents. Um, and so, oh, sorry. So we don't have a problem here about explaining how the physical world gives rise to consciousness, how it's related to consciousness, it doesn't exist. All there is, is consciousness or conscious agents at least. They're fundamental. There's no hard problem. Uh, I, I like this for its boldness. I think the only way to deal with the hard problem is by taking bold steps. And this is a bold step. Um, I want to go another way. I don't, I'm not going to get into detailed criticism of this view here. I, I do have a couple of questions which will lead into my own take on this. One is, okay, so there's an interface here. Who's the user of it? 
who is the the I that is experiencing this interface and using it and acting on the world in the light of the information presented in the interface. Well, I suppose the view here is that conscious agents are just fundamental. Uh, there isn't really an explanation of how they arise. They just are part of, they're just a fundamental feature of reality and reality is just constituted by them. So I suppose that's, that's okay. Um, but another question is how does this user, this conscious agent extract the information about fitness that's encoded in the icons? If the icons have been created to encode information about fitness, how, how is this information read and used? And, and more fundamentally, why do we even need an interface? Why can't the information about fitness be presented directly to the user? Why does it need to be rendered in the form of an icon? Now, okay, I, um, I accept that the, the interface theory is, is to some extent metaphorical. And so there may be ways of, 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 of dealing with this, but I, I don't see why we need that rendering in the form of an interface. What matters is that the user, whoever it is, gets the right information and acts in the right way on the world. So it seems that neither fitness beats truth nor conscious realism actually requires the interface theory. We could agree that what our sense is presented with is information solely about fitness. And we could agree that reality is composed of other conscious agents, while it seems to me rejecting the interface theory. The interface theory doesn't seem an essential component of this. Um, now this leads me into to my own take on this, which is essentially an attack on the interface. <clears throat> so again, here's the problem of consciousness. How does the, how does the thing on the, on the left create the thing on the right? And my option is to dissolve the thing on the right. I think the universal acid can dissolve it too. Here's a way of, there are many reasons for, for taking this view, but here's, here's one that I find particularly compelling. Why would we need mental qualities? Why would we need an interface, a show, a rendered interface that's rendered in the form of some uh, image that is colored with mental qualities. Why would we need that? Suppose there were these mental qualities. So what happens is stimuli are transduced from the, I mean, the function of our sense organs is to transduce incoming stimuli, proximal stimuli into patterns of neural signaling. That's what they do. That's what the retina does. Suppose that happened. And then somehow these patterns of neural signaling were, were rendered were transformed, were transduced again into qualitative properties, into qualia. Well, what would happen then? What effects would these qualitative properties have on the rest of the activity of the brain? And this is what Daniel Dennett calls the hard question. Here's how he puts it. And then what happens? If you want a whole theory of consciousness, this is the question you must ask and answer after you've delivered some item to consciousness. Okay, so it's rendered it. The, the information is rendered in the form of this inner image of a tomato decked out with these phenomenal properties. What happens then? That's got it into consciousness. Dan says, if you instead you just stop there and declare victory, we've explained that here's, here's consciousness. That's it, we've got it you've burdened the subject or the self with the task of reacting, of doing something with the delivery. And you've left that task unanalyzed. What's the point of this rendering? What's the point of this inner show, this, as Dan calls it, this Cartesian theater? Well, it seems that if it was to have any effect at all on <coughs> the rest, on the rest of uh, on our reactions, on our physiological, psychological, behavioral reactions, then it's got to be transduced back into neural signaling because that's the language of the brain. That's how things get done in the brain, through neural signals. So somehow this, these phenomenal properties, this qualia, these mental images would have to be 
detected <clears throat> and information about them would have to be transduced back. The information they contain would have to be transduced back into neural signaling, which could then affect control systems and the rest of the brain. So why not simply cut out the middle? It would make no difference. All the effects would be the same. Reactions, responses would be exactly the same. That's a case for thinking we don't need mental qualities and that everything would be the same without them. So what sort of picture of consciousness do we have if we cut out that middleman, if we dissolve this inner world of mental qualities? Do we have to say there isn't such a thing as consciousness? Of course we don't. We just have to reconceptualize consciousness as something else. And here's a picture that, again, it's a picture developed by, by uh, Dennett, but it's one that I think is very plausible, at least as a an outline to be filled in. And it's just something like this. Sensory information is conscious when it's available to a wide range of control systems. So information about the tomato is transduced into neural signaling by the retina and these signals are widely distributed to control systems within the brain where they then generate a vast range of reactions. Physiological, psychological, behavioral, many of these are internal reactions, they're not reactions, overt reactions in terms of behavior. They're micro changes in the state of the brain, changes in habits, uh, response to the next round of stimuli. So some of them are macro changes, changes in behavior, some of them are micro changes. There's a vast suite of these. And that's what consciousness is. Consciousness consists in a complex of informational and reactive processes. It's informational influence or fame. Information gets to be conscious by having the right kind of effects. And here's a, another quote from, from Dennett. Being an item in consciousness is not at all like being on television, not being rendered on some inner screen. It's rather, it's a species of mental fame. It's cerebral celebrity. Those contents are conscious that persevere, that monopolize resources long enough to achieve certain typical and symptomatic effects, the memory on the control of behavior and so forth and so forth. It's easy to say that, but spelling this out, spelling out the, 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 the range and complexity and subtlety of these effects, that's, uh, that's where all the work will get done in this theory. Just saying, oh, it's the, it's the effects makes it sound kind of unimpressive when you spell out what these effects are then I think you start to get the meat in the theory. Now, this is compatible, I think, with Don's claims about um, what perception is doing, that it's tracking fitness, not, tr not truth. This information doesn't need to be information uh, about the true structure of reality. It needs to be information about fitness pets, affordances. Uh, again, as I said, that fitness beats truth doesn't, I think, require the interface theory of perception. Well, is that, not that sensory information is always political, only that it's not rendered as in inner images. And I take it that it's for science to tell us what reality is really like. Indeed, science tells us that colors as, as, they, see, as they appear to us, as we tend to think of them as qualitative, proper, pure qualities <clears throat> are like in, in nature. Well, that's okay saying that, but you'll object. But surely we are also aware of our own experiences. I mean, we're not just aware of the world. We also have some sort of inner awareness. We can recognize our own experiences when we have them. We can describe them. We can react to them. We can tell people what they're like, that that experience wasn't very nice, that it was, uh, that you remembered having that sort of experience before, that this experience is a bit like the one you had yesterday, that this coffee tastes of insult and so forth. So what do we say about this on this kind of picture that I'm developing? Well, we say that this depends on mechanisms, that our exp experiences are brain processes, brain states, and that our awareness of them depends on mechanisms, mechanisms of introspection. And again, introspection, like perception, is an evolved system. And again, like perception, it serves fitness, not truth. The information it provides 
is impressionistic, schematic. It's adapted to the needs that introspection serves. And those are needs, I, I, I would say, of communication, so that we can tell other people about our experiences, and self-control, the ability to react to our own experiences and adopt certain attitudes towards them, to cultivate experiences we like, deliberately avoid ones we don't. So. And indeed, this is where Dennett himself uses an interface money, uh, metaphor. He says that our awareness of our own, of our own minds is shaped um, to uh, the purposes of self-control, like, just like a computer desktop interface. But of course, he doesn't think that interface is rendered in, uh, uh, as an image. So, fitness beats truth introspectively. This is the claim of illusions that introspection is systematically misleading. Introspection delivers impressionistic subpersonal reports on complex brain processes, which make us believe that we have direct and infallible awareness of simple phenomenal properties. When you ask yourself what you're experiencing, subpersonal introspective processes, you tap the information that's provided by subpersonal introspective processes, and this information is very schematic. But it creates strong beliefs on them. Beliefs that you don't you don't really know where they come from. It just says, look, it's one of those experiences again, and it has that kind of relation to other experiences, and it provokes these kind of reactions, and it's just there for you. And you don't know where this belief has come from. It seems immediate and compelling, but it's the product of these introspective subpersonal reports. Uh, and this is the illusion in illusionism. So the suggestion here is that fitness beats truth, not just perceptually, but introspectively. And there you've got another application of universal asset. Introspection no more tells you what your experiences are really like than perception tells you what the tomato is really like. Now, at this point, uh, this objection usually comes up. Um, illusions themselves involve awareness of mental qualities. So if I'm hallucinating a tomato, there's no tomato that's dropped out of the picture, but there is a tomato appearance in my mind. That's what an illusion is. So if I'm hallucinating an appearance of a tomato, if my introspection is misleading me into thinking that there's an appearance of a tomato when there isn't, then there must be a second mental appearance, a mental appearance of that mental appearance. And so illusionism is circular. The only way to spell out this notion of illusion is to suppose that there's another mental appearance, and then we're back with explaining that mental appearance, and so we've got no further. Uh, I admit that that objection is invited by the word illusionism, but I think it simply misunderstands uh, the basics of the position. Look, According to the illusionist, being aware of external objects doesn't involve being aware of mental appearances, and that's the whole claim. These things just drop out of the picture. It what it does involve is being related to the external things, whatever they are, through a web of informational sensitivities and react reactive dispositions. And perceptual illusions occur when this information is inaccurate systematically misleading. So that's the model of ordinary perceptual illusions that the illusionist has. There's no need to, to have appearances, mental appearances in this picture. You just need misinformation. And so you just apply that to the introspective story. Being aware of internal objects doesn't involve being aware of mental appearances them. It involves being related to these internal objects through a web of informational sensitivities and reactive positions just like perception and introspective illusions occur when the information is inaccurate or systematically misleading exactly the same so the objection is right that there's a there would be a parallel between introspective illusions and perceptual illusions but it simply assumes the view of perceptual illusions that the illusionist wants to reject it's just, just assuming realism about about, about phenomenal consciousness, and then applying the same uh, analysis to um, 
to introspective illusions. So on this picture, what we have are two kinds of consciousness. We have perceptual consciousness, which consists in a rich and informational and reactive engagement with one's environment. And we have introspective consciousness, which is a rich informational and reactive engagement with one's own perceptual consciousness, with the states that realize one's own perceptual consciousness. And both can be misleading. Perspective consciousness, a nice way of putting it here is that it's not just noticing things in the world, it's noticing you're noticing. It's not just reacting to things in the world, it's reacting to your reacting. Okay, so I said that introspection is tracking features of our experience for, uh, uh, that, that are useful, that it's useful for us to know about. Um, what specifically is it tracking and why? Well, in this view, qualitative properties themselves are merely intentional objects. They're things that only exist as the objects of our representations, of our beliefs. They're like uh, uh, mythical uh, beings. But although they are not real, although qualitative properties are not real, our judgments about them correspond to something real, just exactly as on Don's view, our, our, our judgments about the spatiotemporal world corresponds to something real. There's undoubtedly a, a real basis to this. Um, and my suggestion is that introspection tracks, crucially tracks the patterns of reaction that experiences produce. This is the crucial element, the crucial feature that in generating our beliefs about qualitative properties, it, is the tracking of patterns of reaction. And these patterns of reaction are important to us because they reflect the significance of stimuli. Perception selects stuff that's important for us to know about. It's important for us to know about because of the reactions it produces. If we know about those reactions, then we know about the significance of the stimuli that are producing them. Okay. So, I mean, we don't need to know about those reactions in order to have the reactions, okay? So, we, you know, you could just react, fine. But if you know about those reactions, then you get a further, a further level of control becomes available to you because now you can know what the significance of this stimulus is. It doesn't just have the stimulus and produce the reactions, you now can think about the significance and adopt all kinds of attitudes on the basis of that. So judgments about qualitative properties express the significance that stimuli have for us. If you like, their affordances, what opportunities or threats they afford to us. And I, I think it's pretty clear that that's a useful thing to know about. And that's what introspection is telling us about. But it packages it in a way that we interpret as beliefs about pure qualities. We don't need to know the details of the reactive patterns. We just need to know it's of that kind it's one of those things again that does that to us and it's different from that sort of thing uh, but it's a bit similar to that and the overall valence of it is positive or negative or whatever it might be it's a kind of encapsulation of the significance of the stimulus that's what introspection is capturing and there's a final twist to this which is that if our judgments about if our judgments about qualities are tracking our reactions, then they're tracking something about us. But we don't, we don't think of it in that way. We don't think of qualities, the redness of the tomato as being a feature of us. We think of it as being a feature of the object, independent of us, the object in the world. Now that's, again, another sort of mis, uh, uh, misinterpretation, but it's a very useful one. What I think happens is something like this, representations of these reactive patterns are bound to the representations of the stimuli that evoke them. So that it, the brain represents objects as infused with this significance that it's been tracking. And here's where I think Don's work actually wonderfully, is a wonderful resource for the illusionist because I mean, a great deal of Don's um, uh, book is devoted to explaining this, this psychological significance of colors, textures, chromatures, 
um, what these things mean for us, what signals they convey to us, what adaptive signals they convey. And that this is precisely the sort of stuff that the illusionist uses to explain our intuitions about phenomenality. These intuitions about phenomenality are really just a way of encapsulating the significance that things have for us. <clears throat> so I think there's a way of reading Don's work which um, can be, it's very congenial to illusions, at least reading those aspects of it. Okay, so that's the, the headline story about illusions. It's, it takes a very different route to solving the hard problem than the one that Don takes, but I think there are a lot of, as Don himself emphasized in his talk, a lot of commonalities between them. And I think there are a lot, there's lots of material that both sides can agree on. Now, whether we're going to get to a position where you go so far around the circle that you actually come back together and, and agree, I don't know, but um, I think there's certainly a lot of, 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 of overlap. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Keith. That was wonderful. Um, there's several questions in the chat. Um, I'll ask two questions uh, from the chat that are specific, more, specific, more specific to uh, Keith's talk first, and then we'll go ahead and open up for um, a set of general questions to both uh, Keith's uh, talk and Don's talk. Okay, the first one, let's see. Keith, um, how would you respond to the claim that the existence of phenomenal consciousness is a primary datum? Well, I deny it. Um, I, 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 what I would want to do is to explain why we think that it's a primary datum. I agree that it seems, like it, it seems as if it is. And I think one reason for that is that our judgments about it are the product of subpersonal mechanisms of which we know absolutely nothing. I mean, if I the compare, contrast with perception, if I just look around me here, I see various things around me and I think, yeah, they're, they're real, they're there, I can just, you know. But I know that this is mediated by certain mechanisms. I know that I need eyes to see and I know that my eyes can trick me. And so I can, if I'm not sure whether my eyes are telling me the truth, I can ask someone else to have a look and say, is that really, you know, that, that color, is it really doing that and so on. With introspection, it's very different. We just look inwards and we get this whole bunch of intuitions, the whole bunch of beliefs and convictions about what's there. But we've no idea of what mechanisms are producing those beliefs, and there's no way we can get anyone else to check them. No one else, I can't say, just you know, come and introspect this and see if I'm getting it right. Not yet, anyway, maybe we can in the future. So it just seems that these beliefs are just, these things are just immediately presented to us. We've no idea of all the mechanisms that are producing these, these convictions about our inner lives. And we've no way of checking their accuracy. And we confuse that, if you like, um, we, we make, because we don't know what the mechanisms are, we assume there aren't any mechanisms, that our awareness is direct. And because we have no way of questioning these beliefs, we assume they're unquestionable. So we think that it's just a datum, it's just something, and maybe we even think that this is something we could be more sure of than anything else. But if you take seriously the idea that we are just parts of the natural world and uh, that, you know, all our knowledge is the product of some sort of mechanism, that we don't know things magically, then there has to be a mechanism. And that mechanism may be misleading. Okay. And a second question. Um, if you cut out mental qualities, does that mean that we directly perceive reality as it is? That is, does your view entail naive realism? No, 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 not at all. Um, the information that we get about the world can be incredibly distorted. Uh, I, I'm not denying that there are mediating processes involved. Of course there are. Um, you know, the, there's all this, everything that the retina does and everything that happens after that in case of vision, of course, and this can go wrong. The point is that we're not, there's nothing that we are presented with at a personal level in between, all that we're presented with is an external world, as it were. All that our brain provides us with a bunch of co convictions about the world being there and the things being there. Now, those convictions can be wrong, but they're not based on our being, <coughs> being presented with some Im intermediate items that we're right about. Okay? Nothing at the, the question is what we present. I mean, nobody thinks that we're directly presented, I take it, with objects in the world without any me mediating mechanism. Uh, the question is whether we are presented at a personal level 
with something that we are actually personally aware of in between the external world and um, and our reactions. And I, I say no, that we are, we are um, we, the world for us is just the world of our reactions, if you like. Okay, thank um, you. Um, there, there are a couple of more questions that are specific to, to each of your talks, but I'll go ahead and ask more general questions and then you mm -hmm. could respond. Um, and maybe the first one is, how would you relate your view of consciousness, so illusionism, um, how would you relate to other theories, for example, to the global workspace theory? Mm -hmm. You can also mention other theories as well, and Don, feel free to please um, chime in as well. Um, well, uh, for me, I think global workspace theory chimes very well with the sort of picture of consciousness as informational frame. Uh, I, if you if you think that global workspace theory is an explanation of how there is this inner uh, this inner world of qualities, then no, of course I don't agree with that. I don't think that needs explaining. I think it, what it, it's a theory of informational access within the brain, and a very good one. Um, I don't think it explains something further than that. If you if, if you take it to be a realist theory, um, but I think it's a perfectly good story about what this informational fame involves. Don, do you have any thoughts? I, I agree with Keith on that. I, I would say that, um, yeah, it's a great theory of, of access, but, but um, doesn't at all get at the, what proponents of the hard problem would, would say is the, what they're really after, right? And in, in particular, I mean, the kind of comment I would have for many of these theories is to say, great, give me a specific example, mint, the taste of chocolate. I, all I want is for you to give me one where you tell me exactly the architecture of the global workspace and tell me why that architecture has to give rise to the taste of mint, why it could not be the flavor of vanilla or the sound of a trumpet. Just give me one. We're trying to do science here. I'd like something that's precise and testable for one specific experience so I can go check and see if you're wrong. You, you know how I would respond to that question? You know, I would, I would go to you, Don. Go to you. And I would say, Don, tell me all about the reactions that Mint produces, you know, uh, about its physiological effects, its right. psychological effects, it, everything about the emotions, the associations. What you know, it's, it's tracking things that are significant to us. How are they significant? What difference does it make to the way that we react and respond? Let's get, let's get this in, you know, in the, let's get the complete story about this. Why is that significant? What difference does the presence of Mint make to me from a point of view of fitness? Tell me all that story. Then let's look at the mechanisms in the brain that produce those reactions that we're talking about. Then we assume that, well, then we look for the mechanisms that track those mechanisms the introspective mechanisms that track those, and that's our story. That's but what this I want to say. We, this, but, but this is why we need exactly the sort of work that you're doing to make illusionism work. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. And we're both on the same page that, that for this to be a science, that's, that, that's hard work. It's extremely hard work. And it's, it's time to go beyond the hand waves and to actually absolutely. do that hard work and, and come up with specific models. So I, on that, we're, we're completely agreed. My one of the this is one of the things what reasons why I, I think this why one of my worries is about looking for the neural correlates of consciousness because the problem there is you can't really look for the neural correlates of something that is essentially private. All you can look for are neural correlates of indications of consciousness, button presses, reactions of some sort. You can look for those. You can look for the neural in fact they're not even the, just for the correlates you can look for the mechanisms for the what that's actually causing the reactions you can do that you can't look for the neural correlates of something that's essentially private and i think you probably agree with that because that's why you want to take consciousness as of conscious agents as fundamental right yeah and so we're, we're in agreement on that that i mean there there are cases like for example if you have a stroke and you can't see color anymore and, and we see that with a bunch of patients, there's some sense in which we can say that we're getting something that at least the phenomenal reports of these people are all the same. And we have the same brain area that's being damaged. And so we can use that data to then try to start to do this hard work that we're talking about, where, where we explain you know, for IIT, 
give me the integrated information um, causal structure that must be identical to or give rise to the taste of mint. And why should that causal structure be the, the taste of mint? And why could not it be the smell of an orange? I mean, that's the that, hard that, work that has to be done. That can't be done. That can't be done so long as you think of the, the smell as something kind of like a, just a, a pure unstructured quality. Right. You so it as a bunch of, of reactions to adaptive feature, to, you know, to, 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 to feature the world, then we can do it, start to do it. We've got to unpack it. Love to see. Yeah. Absolutely. And by the way, I also agree with you, um, Keith, that um, the notion of a uh, Cartesian theater is, is not needed. And, and even the notion of a self in, in the work that I'm doing on conscious realism, there's no notion of self that, that's fundamental. Yeah. And, and so, that in, so that even when I take consciousness as fundamental, I'm absolutely not taking it that we're authoritative about our introspections. Um, I mean, I, I do a lot of work in psychophysics. Yeah. 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 You, just one day in the lab will convince you that we're not authoritative on, on our, our, you know, so it, it's, 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 it's you know, lots of experiments I've done where I know what the person's seeing and their reports about why they're behaving the way they do are, are, are false. And I know why that they're, they're, they're false. And so, so yeah, even the idea of taking consciousness is fundamental. It doesn't require a Cartesian theater. And I agree there's none, not even a self and not even authoritativeness about your own conscious experiences. Right. Yeah, I think there's, I, I, we were talking a little bit about this before we started, but I think there is a way of, 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 of reconciling our, our, our positions on that. It, it depends whether we're talking about, you know, consciousness as some sort of theoretical construct that might be able to do some deep explanatory work, bring it right down the physics, or whether we're talking about it as this impression that we're inclined to report to each other and right. wave our hands around about what it's like and so on. I mean, well, and I think as scientists, we need to pursue both, right? We, 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 we should pursue both right. theories, try to make them as precise as possible, get them to the point where they can go head to head and make testable okay. predictions. No, no, that's okay. what we do. Okay. Okay. One more question. Um, so the, the transduction model, the, uh, someone mentioned that this is reminiscent of William Cavan's uh, concept of neural attractor basins. Uh, maybe the attractive basins become the icons on the desktop. You know, if you could comment on that. Well, yes, no, the, the kinds of models that I'm working on with the theory of conscious agents are going to be highly related to that kind of notion that we're looking for um, asymptotic behaviors that are stable um, or metastable, um, attraction, basins of attraction. And, and in some sense, that's where I'm also looking for the connection between a theory of consciousness that it's so. And, and physics. The specific hypothesis that I'm working on right now is that um, physics of space and time and so forth is only capturing the asymptotic behavior of this network of conscious agents. So there's this vast social network of conscious agents. There's the dynamics on graphs that we have to study, the mathematics of it, but it will have certain long-term um, behaviors, certain um, stationary states or asymptotic states and the reason why, from a, a physics point of view, we never see consciousness is because we're not seeing the step-by-step -step behavior of consciousness. We're only seeing the long-term asymptotic behaviors. It's very much like if I'm looking at the traffic from a helicopter, way up in a helicopter. I mean, I, all I see is what looks like fluid dynamics of little points that are the cars, right? So I can just use fluid dynamics to describe it, but I'm missing all the agents inside that are worried about hitting the brake and turning the wheel and so forth. And so physics, from this point of view, is only looking at the attractions, is not looking at the step, the, the, the attractor basins, is not looking at the step-by-step -step behavior. So that's, that. I mean, again, I'm probably wrong, but that's that's where I'm, where I'm going. I'm trying to get a dynamical model of consciousness where it's only the asymptotics is what we see in, in physics, and that explains why physics never sees consciousness when it's, when it's looking around. And Keith, did you want to comment? Uh, no, I, 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 no, I think, I think that's, I think that's okay. we, we are uh, approaching that, that uh, time, but I think we have a few more minutes. Um, so I can maybe throw in another question. Um, let's see. If objects do not exist, 
and they are just illusions. Um, are we, as humans, are we also illusions? And maybe throwing a, a couple of that with another question, which is the alter states. How would you, you know, factor in the alter states of consciousness as well, and, and how that might relate to um, your, your theory, your approach towards illusionism? Right. So, great question. It applies not just to the moon and to electrons and protons and, and rocks. It applies to my very body, right? That my body itself, on this point of view, the interface view, would be just another icon. And, and even my introspection, as we've now, this is where we, we, we agree that even our introspections are leading to mis, misguided or misleading conclusions. And so, um, this is a very unsettling point of view. It's saying that everything that we thought we knew, that we were sure about, my body, I am, what my body does, and my introspections, what we're saying is that, uh, I'm pr proposing that the best science here, at, namely evolution of natural selection, is saying, uh, not so quick. Um, there's no selection pressures for us to have truthful understandings about any structure and objective reality, and that includes my very body, that includes my introspection about myself. It's from that point of view, and, and again, by the way, I, I should take another, put another point on the table, and that is, as scientists, it's our job to take the best current scientific theories that we have and press them, right? Really push them to their limits and see if we can make them break with general relativity, quantum field theory, evolution by natural selection. Those are the three big pillars of modern science. So that's, and that's what I'm doing. As scientists, we don't have to believe these theories, right? They're, they're tools. So, so I, I can be very, very clear. Um, I think that those three theories I mentioned are beautiful theories. They're the best that we've ever come up with. And I think they're all deeply false. And the goal of a good scientist is to figure out where they're deeply false and to take the next step. If we still were doing the doctrine that Newton is right, and you're a heretic if you disbelieve Newton, we would have lost all of the advances of the 20th century. And so the 21st century, we have to say, evolution by natural selection, general relativity, quantum field theory, these are incredibly impressive things. Every scientist needs to understand them, but not believe them. We want to break them. And so I'm using evolution and evolutionary game theory in that spirit. It, the reason I use it is because it's the only tool we have that's appropriate right now. It's the best tool we have. And that tool, as well as quantum um, theory together with general relativity, I'm sorry, quantum theory and special relativity, they entail together that space-time is doomed, right? That's when, when Nemo is saying space-time is doomed, it, it's not a, a whim. He's saying when you push on special relativity together with, so locality, Lorentz invariance, and unitarity, when you put those together, space-time is gone, especially when you bring in gravity. Um, so it, it's gone. There are no local observables in space-time. And, and that is what I just said is one of the most profound things that's come out of physics. There are no local observables in space-time, period. That means the very notion of finding causality locally in space-time is out the window. How do we rethink our nature and models of reality when we don't have any local observables in space-time? And, and Nima and these, and these geniuses in physics are they're cheerfully going after it. I mean, they're going after structures like his amplitudehedron that are completely outside of space and time. They, they don't care about space and time. They don't care about unitary. They don't care about any of the stuff that, that we care about. But it turns out that space and time and unitarity emerge uh, as, as sort of um, side effects of the structure of the amplitudehedron and its positivity. When you go to the boundaries, you get uh, you know, the, the kind of things that we interpret but as space, time, and, and locality. But that's not the fundamental reality. And so what we want to do as scientists, and, and also, by the way, in the science of consciousness, is we, we can't be classical physicists. We, we, we can't be Newtonian in our thinking. We, 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 I mean, the physicists are moving well ahead. Space, time is doomed. There are no local observables. If we want to have theories that aren't going to be dismissed and, and silly, we, we at least need to be understanding what are the new fundamental concepts that the physicists are dealing with and try to make sure that our theories uh, aren't just going to be bulldozed over by, by what's, what's coming next in physics. So, so the notion of individual objects in space-time having causal powers is dead. 
And that's, I mean, we, we have to wake up to that. Causality in space-time is dead. There, there's, there's something deeper and the physicists are going after it. They don't know what it is. So it's really exciting, but, but you know, we need to be careful in consciousness studies not to be left with um, dinosaurs. <laughs> Keith, would you like to add? I, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic. I mean, I, I agree with it. You know, that, that, you know it, it's well, physicists are going to take us where they're going to take us, and um, uh, we, we, we've got to listen. I, where I think I, I, I get, I get off this maybe line of thought, this train of thought is in thinking that there's really any connection here with consciousness. I think. Um, this, you know, physicist, phys physics may, you know, force us to rethink, you know, how we, we think about the natural world. Uh, so it's going to force us it, to, it, to that extent to make us rethink what digestion is and reproduction is. I don't think consciousness is any different. I, I think it, 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 it's in that same sort of category of biological processes like digestion. And, reproduction and so on. And so whatever general rethinking of the structure of the world we're going to have to do in the light of modern physics is going to apply to consciousness as well as those. But from within the perspective of, you know, the, the, the sort of explanatory framework that we have of biology and so on, it's just a biological problem. I don't think it's a metaphysical problem in itself. I don't put it like this. I don't think consciousness raises any metaphysical or deep um, uh, issues in physics that are not raised by any other biological process. I don't think it's special. I mean, it is special in that it's amazingly complex and you know, wonderful, but I don't think it's metaphysically special. So that's where I would get off that bit. And that's why I don't think, I think that, um, that, and I think maybe, I mean, who knows, it could be that we, that, you know, that Don's right and that, you know, right at the fundamental level, we do need something like consciousness you know the conscious agents right at that fundamental. but i don't think that's got much connection with consciousness as we talk about it at an everyday level i think that's a kind of I mean, partially even a cultural construction our notions of consciousness that we have um i think we have this this idea that we can just do introspection and sit and sit in our arm just do introspection and conclude something about about the nature of consciousness and about the nature of reality i think that's no no no, no, no. so Yes, they may fundamentally think it, but I don't think it uh, m links up with this traditional philosophical problem of consciousness. I don't think that's, I think that's a kind of non problem. <laughs> Perhaps not the right venue to say that. Though. Given the time, um, are there any final words that you would like to share? I would just like to say how much I enjoyed reading Don's book, um, and that I think there's an awful lot in it that will, that is, that. Um, uh, whether or not you agree with his with his metaphysical um, positions, I think there's an awful lot of, of great stuff about about the psychology of perception and about the, the the evolution of perception, which I think everyone should read. So, so that. thank you. And Don. Well, well thank you. And and uh, the same about Keith's book, Illusionism. I uh, I don't want to always read people that agree with me. That's the point of science: is to have others push you and make you think deeply about what, and so that's what I got from Keith's book is he pushed me around, made me think hard about this stuff. And, and so thank you very much. And that's, and that's my attitude about this whole thing. It's not about dogmatism and being right. Of course mm -hmm. I'm wrong. So I just put that, of course I'm wrong. The, the whole point is to be precise so we can figure out as quickly as possible where we're wrong and move on. So it's not about defending positions. It's about having smart people show us where we're wrong and then we can move on. So thank you, Keith. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Okay, so on behalf of TSC, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a wonderful discussion with both of you. Um, and the audience, thank you again for joining us. It was, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Great.